Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today I'm going to take you through how to create and analyse a two-way frequency table. This is part of a mathematics strand that covers right across the curriculums in Queensland, Western Australia, Tasmania, Victoria and New South Wales. So welcome if you are joining me for the very first time. You may also encounter two-way frequency tables in the real world when you finish high school, such as when you're looking on your social media feed, when you're reading a newspaper or a journal article, or even at university, quite typically when you're reading journal articles for a variety of different courses, statistics, science, mathematics, education, you name it, you may encounter a two-way frequency table. So we're gonna cover what one is, and then we're gonna do some worked examples in this particular video. So let's get right into it. What is a two-way frequency table? Two-way frequency tables are a part of mathematics that crosses over between statistics and probability. Because we're looking at two different data sets, then that comes under bivariate data analysis, although we don't do scatter plots. We're representing the information in a table, not in a graph. It can also fall under probability because you can use the information to determine what is the likelihood of a certain event occurring. And you would have seen two-way tables as part of probability all the way back to grade nine. So for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna pop this one in a playlist all by itself because it's kind of a bit of both. Now, it's a way of organizing and comparing two different data sets where you've got two different categorical variables represented. Now, you may not know what a categorical variable is. There are two types of variables in a nutshell. Firstly, you've got categorical and you've got numerical. Now, if I was to ask you a question in a survey, your answer could be a word or it could be a number. So if I was to ask you, what is your favorite TV show? then your answer is going to be a word. You might say Stranger Things, or you might say The Handmaid's Tale or something like that. If I was to ask you how many siblings you had, your answer might be one. In my case, it's one or two or three or four or however many you've got. So one answer is a word, one answer is a number. Categorical data, numerical data. Now for two-way frequency tables, we are using categorical variables only. This is an example of a two-way frequency table. You can see that there are two different things that we're looking at here, the gender of the participants in whatever kind of study this was, as well as the sport that they've chosen for school, whether that was baseball, basketball, or football. So when they give an answer for gender, it's gonna be one or the other. For sport, it's gonna be one or the other. These are not ones where you can answer in multiple categories. Some key features of a two-way frequency table are firstly that you've got two sets of meaningful headings and I put the word meaningful in there because sometimes people just take shortcuts and they might write the word sport. Well there's lots of different situations in life where you may play sport. In this particular case it's what school sport have you chosen so give a little bit more information get a better result. Now you've got headings on the vertical and on the horizontal. Vertical, horizontal. You can see that there's two sets of headings. There's headings and there's subheadings. So here's our horizontal here, the school sport that was chosen as well as the gender of the student that chose the sport. And you've got those second sets of heading that break that first group up even further into more subsets. We've also got totals along the bottom and along the right hand side, very important. Sometimes I see students in exams forget that there's two sets of totals and they end up losing some marks because they haven't done a second set of totals. Now, you can see two-way frequency tables in a number of ways, typically in an exam setting. Firstly, you might be given a table like this where there's blank spaces. For example, we don't know how many male students play bas baseball and we don't know how many female students played football. Those two cells are blank. So we may be asked to simply complete the table. Alternatively, we may be given all of the information and asked to transform this into what's called a two-way frequency percentage table, which is basically this raw information turned into percentages. Alternatively, you may just be given the complete information and asked to draw some conclusions from that information and make a statement um, statistically about how something might occur. We're gonna do all of these things today in our worked examples coming up now. So let's read our first worked example. We've got grade nine and 10 students who were given a statistics exam at the end of the term. There's 120 year nine students and 107 passed and 80 year 10 students and 12 did not pass. So we need to put this into a two-way frequency table and comment 
on which cohort performed the best. So we've got two parts to this question. Firstly, we have to create the table and then we've got to analyze the table. So first thing to remember is I've got two sets of categorical data. I've got to think about what are these going to be? Well, firstly, I've got what grade are the students in? They're in either year nine or they're in year 10. You notice that they're not in both at the same time. So that's one thing that's important about categorical variables in a two-way frequency table. You don't fit into more than one category. You've also got the second category. You passed or you failed. You don't do both. So in this case, numbers are only going to fall into one spot in the table. Now I need to work out which way to set my table up. Here's an example that I created earlier of how I would set this particular table up. Now you might wonder, why did I put the, the grade as my horizontal title and not the result? Well, typically it's convention to put your explanatory variable at the top. You get put into a grade first and then you do your exam and you pass or you fail. So you typically, your grade would be that explanatory variable. If you're thinking about graphing something like this, it's the variable that goes on your x-axis and it explains the variable or your response variable that's on your y-axis. So that's why we put grade up the top. Some teachers get a little bit pedantic about this. It's important to check with your teacher all the time as to whether this is something that's going to be important to them. At the end of the day, whether you put it up the top or on the side, is kind of irrelevant as long as the numbers are correct and people can read by you know taking down one column and coming across and working out what the number is that's related to it but some people as i mentioned are quite concerned that things are in the right places so it's important that you understand what's expected of you okay now it's time for us to put some information into this table it's important that we make sure we've got columns on the end and down the bottom to put our totals and that we don't forget to do this as well so now let's look at the information that we've been given. Firstly, we've got those 120 year nine students. That means that there's 120 in total. So that goes down the bottom in our totals column. And we know that 107 passed. So we can pop that now into our table. So we've got some missing information in here that we need to fill out. We've also got some other information to put in here. We've got 80 year 10 students in total and 12 did not pass. So I always like to put in the information I have been given in the question first of all, and then work everything else out from there at the end by doing some calculations. It's also important that in your working space, you show where your calculations came from. I haven't done that in this video, but you need to do that yourself. So now we're going to take a subtraction, 120 take away 107 year nine students gives us 13 that failed. And 80 take away 12 that, that failed gives us 68 students or in total for year 10 that passed. So now we're filling out those two columns with that information. Now that these two pieces of information are complete, we can do some addition across each row and we can come up with our totals. We know that there were 120 students in year nine and 80 students in year 10. So that means there's 200 altogether. And then if we add 13 to 12, we get 25 and 107 to 68 gives us 175 students that passed across both grades. So now we've got a complete two-way table. We've done the first part of our worked example. Now we need to work out which cohort performed the best. Okay, now to do that, the best way to think about this is that we've got two cohorts of two completely different sizes. We've got a big cohort of 120 and a big cohort of 80. The best way to compare is with percentages. So what I'm going to do is work out what percentage of year nines passed and what percentage of year tens passed. And then I'm going to compare that pass rate, that's what a percentage is, a pass rate, to from each grade to one to the other. So firstly, I'm going to work out that pass rate. 107 of those year nine students out of 120 in total, multiply that by 100 to change it to a percentage, and I've got 89% of those year nines passed. Do the same with the year 10 information. I've got 85% of those students passed. So the pass rate in year nine was better and therefore year nine was the cohort that performed the best. So I'm gonna write a statement now and I'm gonna give a reason why. I can't just say year nine performed the best, even though that's true, it's not a complete answer and most teachers won't give you full marks for that. So I need to give a reason why. 89% compared um, to 85% who passed in grade 10. I could even take that a step further and do a little bit more digging and analysis and work out the difference in the pass rates. For example, 4%, which is 89 take away 85, 4% more students in grade nine passed when compared to grade 10. So this is a full marks answer now. 
Let's look at another example. Worked example two, a pharmaceutical company developed a new breath test to determine if a person has used illegal drugs in the past 24 hours. This is going to be compared to a blood test, which we already know is 100% accurate. Now in a situation like this, they probably want to bring out a new breath test because it's easier to administer, gives you instant results, whereas a blood test generally needs to go away and be analyzed. So a breath test being more instant. Now the results of the tests are compared below. We've got the blood test results versus the breath test results. In some cases, we've got drugs being detected and drugs not being detected. So we need to answer some questions and analyze this. So this is one where we're not actually going to be doing, um, filling out the table like we did in worked example two in one, we're just going to be analyzing. So our first question is how many people participated in this test? Well, if we look down at that bottom right hand side, we can see that there are a thousand people who did the blood test and the breath test. And we've got different results depending on what they did. What percentage of people that were tested had actually taken drugs? Now we know from the blood test that if there were drugs detected, it was 100% accurate. So they had taken drugs. So that means if we go across from that blood test, 217 people actually took drugs based on that blood test. So now we need to work out what that is as a percentage of the total number of people that were in the actual test. So let's take that now and do 217 divided by 1000, multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage and we've got 21.7% of people had actually taken drugs. Our next question is comment on the accuracy of the test. Well, we know that the blood test is 100% accurate. We wanna work out um, comparing that blood test to the breath test, what um, percentage of people actually had taken drugs that were measured taking drugs or where drugs weren't detected, hadn't taken drugs. This can get a little bit confusing, so just work with me here. So firstly, we've got 128 people um, who didn't take drugs because the blood test was 100% accurate and there were no drugs in their system. But when they did the breath test, it said that they'd taken drugs. 128 people are gonna be accused of something when they haven't actually done it. This could be a really serious situation if a, a company, for example, was using this breath test with their employees and they've suddenly got 128 people who they're gonna accuse of taking drugs when it wasn't actually true. They may actually sack people based on that because it can be a sackable offense to take drugs and operate machinery, for example, with some companies. So that's a problem with this breath test. We've also got 106 people um, who had taken drugs according to the blood test and the breath test didn't even pick it up. That's a problem as well, because if you're a business and you're wanting to make sure that your people that are working for you aren't operating heavy, dangerous machinery while they're using drugs, then there's gonna be 106 people that are gonna be completely missed by this breath test. So not looking good for the breath test at the moment. So now we're gonna need to add these two numbers together and work out what percentage that is out of all the people that did the test. And that means this test is gonna be inaccurate 23.4% of the time. That's a big issue in my books. And I'm pretty sure that pharmaceutical company is not gonna be able to get that breath test across the line. It's not accurate enough. Let's look at another final example today, worked example three. We are looking at the elective subjects that a year 12 cohort has chosen. And we're breaking that down a bit further into their gender. We've got some students who've chosen history, some who've chosen French, and some who've chosen music. Now we need to recreate this table as a percentage frequency table with respect to the student's gender. Now what that with respect to means is that normally when we create a percentage, we're gonna divide a number by a total. And what this is telling us is that the totals that are relevant for us today are their gender, not the subject they've chosen. So we wanna make sure we've reset this table up so that every percentage is showing what percentage chose history dependent on how many males there were or how many females. So let's create the table again. We're gonna basically set up a new table, all the same headings, all the same number of blank spaces, it's going to basically mirror that first one exactly, but we're going to put percentages in here and it's going to be with relationship to the total um, by gender. So firstly, if we look at history and the number of males that chose history, there are 102 males who chose history out of 189 males altogether. So what we need to do is work out that percentage, 102 over 189, times that by 100 to turn it into a percentage means that 
of the boys chose history as their elective and that's what that number is going to be popped into that particular cell there. Now if I've been asked to calculate it with respect to the students elective that they chose I'd be taking that 102 and instead of dividing it by 189 which is the total number of boys I'd be dividing it by 225 which is the total number of students that chose history. So you can understand that reading the question carefully is super important otherwise you're going to use the wrong total to calculate your percentages. Now I'm going to repeat this process. I've got 48 male students who chose French, 48 out of 188, 89 males altogether. So I'm going to work that out as well, multiply that by, by 100, and I've got 25.4% there. And I'm going to repeat the music. So now my total across, according to gender, should be 100%. You're going to see later on when all of the percentages are in there that they're not going to add up to 100% in the columns because we weren't asked to calculate with respect to the elective chosen. We were asked to calculate with respect to the gender. So we'll add up across the rows to 100%. If we repeat that now for female, we're going to use these numbers here across the rows, dividing each of those numbers by 211 and multiplying it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. And there's our numbers there. Now you'll notice if we tried to add it up the columns, for example, history for male and female, we've got 53 plus 58, that's more than 100%. So that's why we don't need to do the totals across the columns here, just across the rows. That's an important consideration. Well, that's all we've got time for in today's video. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this has been a really helpful start for you on your journey to creating and analyzing two-way frequency tables. Don't forget to hit that notifications button to subscribe to the channel so that you'll know when all of our videos are being posted. And welcome to all of our new subscribers. Thank you so much for joining us here at the channel. And do like and subscribe to us also on Facebook. On Facebook we have some little fun facts and also interesting information that you might like to be aware of. Well have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time.